Hello PyCon APAC, this is Anthony Shaw. I'm here to give you a grand tour of VS Code today and show you, I guess, capabilities for Python and more sort of advanced topics as well towards the end of the talk. But the goal really is to show you what VS Code is capable of for Python development and how to set everything up so that your productivity is increased um, and you can make the most of different extensions using some of the configuration tools. Um, and even if you've been using VS Code for a while, you probably might learn some new things as well, which would be great. So yeah, let's get stuck in. So there's a couple of things you're gonna need for this talk. The first thing is a copy of VS Code, which you can get from code.visualstudio.com. If you don't have Python installed already, I strongly recommend getting it from python.org and going to the download section and getting the latest release from here. This is probably the easiest way to install Python um, on any platform. So this is my VS Code up and running. Uh, there's a few things that I've got customized which I can show you in a point, but um, yeah, there's probably a lot going on here. So let me walk through a couple of things. So VS Code is an environment um, for editing pretty much any language. So it's not specific to Python. You can edit, you know, JavaScript, HTML, text files, whatever. Like so. So in VS Code, on the left-hand side, you'll see all these buttons. Uh, these are basically shortcuts to different panels. The one that you'll find at the bottom uh, with this unusual icon is the extensions panel. If you click on that and then search for Python, you should get the Python extension pack. That should be the most popular one at the top and install that and it will download and install a few things for you. So the next thing you'll need to do when you're using VS Code is get familiar with the command palette. So you can find the command palette either from the top menu, if you go to view and then command palette, uh, or you can use one of the shortcuts. So the shortcuts are control shift P for Linux and Windows, or um, the Mac key shift P for Mac OS. This command palette is really where you access all the functionality of the extensions as well as the editor itself. So this is kind of a power user tool um, that's built into VS Code and a lot of the stuff I'll show you I'll access from the command palette. So I strongly recommend using this as a tool. There's actually quite a lot of functionality in the different extensions that's not available through the UI. It's only available in the command palette. So one of the first things you will probably want to do is just to go in, in your keyboard shortcuts and make sure that you're uh, happy with the different bindings and stuff. If you come from a different editor, what I recommend is going in the extension panel and then going to filter at the top, picking category and then picking key maps. And here you'll see all the different key maps that are available. So if you've kind of memorized um, all the shortcuts and stuff for like Atom or Vim or Sublime or something. So if you have basically, if you install that key map, it'll apply those keyboard shortcuts to VS Code. Um, and it just makes your life a little bit easier when you're getting used to the uh, the different shortcuts and stuff to hand. Okay, so you might be wondering why does my VS Code look so different to yours? So VS Code has a massive ecosystem of customizable themes. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose what you want here. They're all available from the extension menu. So if you go back into extensions, click on filter again, category, and then go down to themes. Uh, you'll see the most popular ones at the top. Um, there are both icon theme packs and color theme packs. Uh, so you'll see the VS Code icons and the material icon theme. Probably the easiest way once you've installed any of these theme packs is to open up the command palette that I told you about and then type in theme and you'll see an option here uh, to pick the color theme. So if you do that, you can just actually flick through uh, the different color themes in the menu and see which ones you like. So so the next thing you probably want to customize in VS Code is the font that you're using. Um, so if you press, if you go into preferences in VS Code and search for font, you'll find the editor font family. So this basically configures what font is used uh, when you're working with code. So that's this font here. Uh, you can customize different fonts, the menu fonts and stuff, but the main one you're going to be looking at is the actual code. So, you know, let's let's actually customize that. I recommend going to a website called programmingfonts.org. And in this website, you'll get a list of loads of coding fonts. 
Um, and what's nice about it actually is that you can have a flick through and see what that font would look like um, in a dark theme and you can change it as well if you want to see what it looks like um, in different code styles and stuff like that and you can just have a hack around if you want to see what Python looks like change it at the bottom then back in VS Code you can change this font family uh, to be one that you're happy with. Now since we're working with Python uh, one thing we're probably going to need quite a lot is a terminal. So VS Code has a built-in which you get to from the terminal menu at the top and then pick new terminal. So in this environment uh, I'm using Z shell as my local shell yeah, so it's activated that automatically for me. Uh, I've made a few customizations to my own shell um, which is why it probably looks a bit different to maybe what it's showing in your version of VS Code. If you go in the command prompt and you type preferences and you click on the one that says open set in settings brackets JSON. So this is the text configuration file. Okay, so there's a few configuration settings I recommend changing specifically for the terminal. You can actually have multiple shell profiles. So if you use different shells um, or you want to, for example, open up a Python REPL, then this is something you can configure in this dictionary. So in this dictionary, you can say uh, it's specific to each operating system. So you can have one setting for Windows, one for Mac, and one for Linux. So depending on which operating system you're on, you want to add something for terminal, integrated profiles, and then either OS X, Linux, or Windows. And then basically just give it a key for each shell prompt you want to configure. The path will be the name of the, basically the command to execute. Um, and then if you want to customize the icon, you can. Um, so the ones I recommend setting up would either be bash C shell or um, PowerShell if you're on if you're on Windows, and then also adding one for a Python REPL. So the path would just be Python three to to launch Python three, and then the args would be any additional arguments you want. Dash Q just basically stops the Python version and stuff being printed every time you launch the REPL. So once you've done that. Um, you'll see this plus icon here and you'll actually get this list. So the list that you configured. Okay, so let me show you a project that I have uh, that I've been working on recently and how I've got VS Code set up. Uh, optimally, I guess, this is kind of the way I like it set up. So in the left-hand side, I've got the Explorer window, which has got um, all the files that I'm working on. And then in the right-hand side, I've got both the terminals so I can run any particular commands and stuff. Uh, maybe to do tests or to run um, any additional scripts. And then I've got my editor here. So in terms of the editor, this is just uh, the, all the theming and stuff set up uh, as I demonstrated earlier. There's a few things that I've changed in my settings. So if I jump into, again, into open settings in preferences, there's basically different settings files. You can have one that applies to all projects, which is your uh, user settings basically and this is my user settings file which is massive but let me jump to the important bits so uh, I've got the terminal configuration which I showed you before and then I've got all my Python specific settings here so a couple of things I've changed uh, that you wouldn't get by default first of all I've set the Python language server to pylance this will be default at some point in the future um, but I recommend changing that now. <laughs> uh, so that's like step one is to set the language server setting to pylance. The next thing you can do is that you can set the path uh, for common tools that you might use like um, poetry, pipend, black, py uh, pylint for example, flake hate. So if you set those as the linters when you uh, or the formatters, the code formatters in your project, it kind of gets annoying to to get that prompt every time you open a new project or a new virtual environment. It said, oh, you know, Flake 8's not installed or Black isn't installed. So instead of that, basically in your user settings, you can set the path to Black or Pipenv or Poetry. So I've installed Poetry and Pipenv via um, uh, Pipex, which is like a global install tool uh, for Pip packages. And I've also got Black available on the command line. Um, in my home path so I can just run black anywhere uh, and that would work. So by setting basically a global path for each of these tools, it just makes sure that all of those tools at a minimum are available in all your Python projects. 
The other thing I recommend doing is enabling linting. Uh, so setting Python linting to be on and also enabling Bandit. Bandit is one of the security linters. It will check your code and give you security warnings um, on common mistakes you might make if you've, I don't know, hard coded passwords in there or you've accidentally written some SQL injection vulnerabilities in your code. Uh, it'll give you a nice, uh, nice warning about that. Something else I've changed is the analysis diagnostic mode. So in the language server in PyLance, uh, it will basically read your code and give you warnings about things. Um, if, you, if it thinks you're using types in the wrong way or maybe your functions are wrong. Uh, so it kind of tries to understand what's happening in your Python application. So by default, the diagnostic mode will only apply to open files. Uh, but I like to see the warnings in the Explorer window. So I can see here, oh, main.py has got two warnings, filter pass has got one. So not just the files that I have open, but actually all of the files in my project. So if you change the diagnostic mode to workspace, um, then PyLance will actually run across all the files in your workspace. You probably need a bit more RAM than you would otherwise. So if you've only got a tiny machine, I don't recommend turning that setting on, but if you've got a bit more RAM to spare, then definitely enable that feature. Okay, so those are the generic settings that would apply to all projects. And I tend to say, make sure that there's nothing in here which happens automatically. So don't, don't normally enable automatic formatting in my user settings, because when I'm jumping into a different project, I don't want it suddenly to just go and change all the code uh, without warning me. So as well as having a user settings, you can add a VS code folder in your project and then inside that make a settings.json file. And basically this contains any overrides to a user settings, which apply to the particular project that you're working on or otherwise called a workspace. So these are basically the workspace settings. And in here, there's a couple of things that I like to change. First of all, which is the Python path, uh, which gets set automatically when you run the select interpreter command, which is how you pick which virtual environment to use. Uh, so that gets set for you automatically, then to make sure black is being run. And there's something else you can do, which is you can enable both uh, formatting as well as um, other kind of commands to happen when you press save. So because I've got the formatting provider set as black, what I actually want to happen is that every time I save a, a file, it runs black on that file. And the way you do that is you can set uh, in VS Code, there's this basically way of setting uh, overriding values specifically for a particular language. And that's by having the key for the, the, the name of the language that you want to override in square brackets and then putting any configuration settings in here. So for example, if you wanted to change um, auto indent or something for specifically for Python, you can do that in the settings file. So doing format on save, I just put some white space at the end of the file, press save, and that just uh, disappears automatically. So it just ran black in the background. Um, it's a really nice feature, but I only want to do that on this particular project. Otherwise, if I'm editing some other code, which isn't using black as the formatter, for example, and I press save, then it's just going to go and reformat everything, uh, which is probably not what you want. Okay, so to give you an example of where PyLance comes in, so earlier I showed you how to set PyLance as the language server for VS Code and Python. So PyLance will actually analyze your code and it works with Python type hints as well. So if you're using libraries and functions and you're sending them information, sending them variables, and your types possibly are wrong, then PyLance will warn you. Um, I've got my PyLance configured in a slightly more uh, aggressive mode maybe than uh, what is default, but this is what I recommend. So I showed you before how to set PyLance to run across the workspace. So one of the settings you can override is the type checking mode, which is Python analysis type checking mode. And there are three uh, different modes. By default, it's set to off. Um, I recommend setting it to basic, uh, strict if you um, yeah, if you really want to. <laughs> um, but yeah, I recommend setting it to basic and I'll show you what that does. So in basic mode, that's where I see more warnings uh, about type checking in the libraries that I'm using. So let me give you an example of what PyLance can tell me. So I actually made a typo here um, when I was importing the table type from Rich. 
so it's highlighted that in red. That's definitely an error. Um, Pylance is telling me that, um, first of all, that I'm never referencing that import uh, and it's not even a known uh, symbol inside that module. So I can go ahead and fix that um, and it would correct that issue. Uh, something else it's showing me, which is probably more advanced, is that um, the return type that I've specified in my function doesn't actually match what I'm returning. Um, so it does actually give you a warning if you say that you're going to return a particular type, but then in your yield statement or your return statement, you actually return something completely different. <laughs> um, also, it will warn you if, for example, um, in this function, I've got host name to be an optional string which defaults to none. So if I wrote some code which just assumed that host name was always there, for example, uh, I ran host name dot upper. So I assume that that's a string. It's actually going to warn me because um, that's potentially going to cause an error because if I call this function with host name as none because it's optional, so I'm allowed to do that, uh, then dot upper is just going to raise. Um, an attribute error because it can't call upper on none because it doesn't doesn't exist. So PyLance will actually give you these kind of warnings, which is really nice. Um, so actually what I'm supposed to be doing here is to check that uh, host name is not none because I've set it to be optional. So if you are using type annotations or you're using libraries which use type annotations, PyLance is a hugely powerful feature. Uh, it would also try and make guesses about what the types are by looking at the uh, the code. So uh, the PyLance team have also built a load of type definitions for common libraries. So even if the libraries that you're using don't necessarily ship with type annotations, you might find that there are type annotations already available in PyLance. Another setting that you might want to have available automatically is that you might want to reorganize your imports. Um, so if you're using a library like iSort, for example, to organize all your import statements at the top of the file, into alphabetical order or however you want it to be set up. Um, you can set that to be run automatically as well as doing the formatting. Formatting, so black doesn't reorganize imports. Um, so you can set that by doing editor code actions on save, and then you can add some additional uh, code actions. Source.organize imports is one of those um, that you can do. Uh, so I can have that available. So organize imports will run. So whenever I change, I don't know, for example, if I switch one of these around, uh, then when I press save, it reorganize those imports into the correct order for me. So let me show you the testing functionality in VS Code with Python. So if you're using either unit test or PyTest, then there is built-in support for running your tests and seeing your test output. Uh, inside VS Code with the Python extension installed. So the way you get to this is, again, from the command palette, uh, is you do Python test, and then you'll see this option for configure tests. So you pick which test framework you're using, pick where the tests live. Uh, so in my case, they're in the test folder, and then that will set the correct settings for you. So in settings.json inside the VS Code folder, it's then set PyTest to be enabled and it's set any PyTest arguments. So this is basically going to run PyTest and then test. If there's any particular PyTest settings that you like, for example, if you want to run it in uh, very, very, very verbose mode, you can do that um, by just adding that flag in this test args setting. So once you've done that, um, you can do either run tests uh, from run all tests, uh, which will then at the bottom, you see the notification where it's running the test. You can click on that. So if you want to see the detail and it'll go ahead and run that test suite. This is a pretty comprehensive test suite in this uh, library actually. So let me show you how to open up the UI settings for that. So you'll either see it in the output window, um, which you can get to by going to view at the top and then picking output. Once you've done that, uh, you'll see all the different output windows. Choose Python testing, which is that one. And that's where you can see the PyTest output. Uh, so I can see exactly what's happening in PyTest at the time. Another thing you can do is go to the test panel. If you don't see the test panel, you'll need to right click on the activity bar and make sure that testing is ticked. 
And then once you've done that, you can click on the testing panel uh, and it'll actually show you which tests are running, which ones have passed, which ones have failed. Uh, and you can see that uh, and then rerun individual tests if any of those have failed. Cool, so once all your tests are finished uh, and hopefully passed, you will see the output on the testing panel. So you'll see them broken down into the different folders, the different test files uh, in the case of PyTest, and then you can look at actually individual uh, test groups as well. So for example, right here I've got a test all operators file um, and inside that I've got a parameterized test. So I'm running it with different uh, test settings in a loop. Now that the tests have run, another thing you can do is if you're actually working in the test files, so here if I go and jump to one of the unit tests, so if I look at test cache for example, uh, I'll see the icon on the left hand side to tell me that the last time I ran that test it passed. Also when you hover over the test function, uh, you can actually click just to run that individual test. So you see in the output window it just ran that one individual test. So um, I don't know, let's just make it wrong so it breaks uh, so here this is what happens when a test fails so you'll see the test output uh, in the window and it shows you the output from PyTest um, I've made an assertion that was not correct uh, and it shows me the last time I ran that test uh, it failed but the two times I ran it before it passed so I don't know whatever it is I just changed <laughs> um, is the reason that it failed also if you go in the test window you will also see the failed test uh, in here and you can rerun the test um, in here or you can click on this icon here which will actually run it in debugger if you run it in the debugger it will actually stop execution where it's failed will it should no okay uh, one thing I can do is I can set a breakpoint when I'm rerunning the test uh, by clicking in the gutter and then you can either rerun the test in debug mode by right clicking on the icon and clicking debug uh, or if you're doing it from the menu just click on the play icon with the bug. Once you do that it's going to stop uh, the breakpoint at this line of code which is going to show me and I can inspect each of the different variables. I can look at um, any dictionaries, objects uh, and navigate through any properties and everything live inside the code panel. You can also look at the local variables um, and any global variables you might have in scope on the left hand side in the variables pane um, and you can navigate and explore classes, lists, dictionaries, all the kind of Python types that you would expect. So something else you can set up in VS Code is you can configure command line tasks to be run from the menu and they have kind of different categories and the two defaults are there's a test task and a build task. So if your tests, for example, include more than just PyTest, uh, especially if you use something like Tox, for example, you might want to have just a shortcut to run Tox on your local project. So that's exactly what I've configured in this project. So I, I do use Tox uh, for this particular project. So in tasks.json, which is a file that you have to create in the VS Code folder, there's quite a lot of stuff going on here. I'll drop this in a, a gist or something uh, in the links for the talk. So you can copy and paste this as an example. Um, you have to set the type to be shell, uh, the command here to be a shortcut basically to look up which virtual environment this is configured with. And so that's going to run Python um, and then it's going to run Tox. You can run that in the background in the workspace folder. But the important things is I give it a name and then in the group I set this to be a test task and to be the default test task. So if in the command palette, I do command shift P in the command palette and you do the test task, you'll see run test task. Uh, you can set a shortcut for that. So if you want to do, I don't know, F6 or something to run that, um, that'll actually go and run Tox now. That's what I've configured it to do. And you can do the same thing for builds as well. So by default, there's a build task that you can configure. So in this project, uh, I use Flip, but if you're using Poetry or Setup Tools or something um, to do your package builds, then you can configure a task here just by putting the arguments uh, for Python. Another thing tasks are really handy for is uh, Flask and Django projects where you've got to run things like um, migrations and stuff like that. So let's say, for example, um, we wanted to run Django migrations uh, as a task. Then again, I'd want to run Python 
uh, not dash m. I'd want to run manage.py for for Django, and then run make migrations as the command. Uh, run that in the background, and then just have that as run make migrations. So that'll then be available from the command palette. Um, here you'll see make migrations, which will run that particular command. So yeah, there's Django commands you find yourself needing quite often, and you don't want to have to type it in every time at the terminal. You can just configure these as preset commands. Something else I recommend is an extension called Task Explorer. So you can get Task Explorer from uh, the extension menu. And like I mentioned before, it's this one here uh, by Scott Mies Mieseman. Uh, and Task Explorer will add this little panel inside your Explorer window. And basically, you can see um, in here tasks that have been configured. So if you see the project here and then you go down to VS Code and you expand that, you'll see all the tasks you've configured, including which ones are running. So Tox is still running in the background. And if I want to run uh, Flit or Make Migrations, I can just click uh, Play on the icon. And also you can bookmark them, which is super handy. So that it kind of pins it to the top. Um, I find this great for configuring a whole bunch of tasks for my project, like individual commands that I run quite often, uh, setting them up in task.json and then using the task explorer um, just to make shortcuts for them so I can click them and it just saves me a lot of time. Uh, you can also configure multiple tasks to run in sequence. Uh, this is a bit of an advanced feature, but if, uh, for example, you want flip build to only run once it's done the test, um, then in the task itself, you can add another thing which is depends on and you can say uh, it depends on this task first. So for example, I can say this task depends on tox in order to run. So if I run the build command now, then it's going to run tox first and then run the build. Uh, you can also specify them in order and stuff. And you can have multiple dependencies to build your own sort of mini build pipeline locally. Uh, yeah, there's probably quite far you can go with this feature. So this project that I've also been working on is just a simple fast API application. And I just wanted to pick this one because I wanted to show you how you configure VS Code to run your Python applications. And this isn't just a simple script. This is a, a fast API application and I want to run it through Uvicorn as well. So I guess there's a little bit of complexity involved in actually running this application locally. And I want to be able to put breakpoints in my code uh, and like debug different features and look at, I don't know what's happening when I run this particular route in, in fast API. So, you know, you set breakpoints just as you would in any other IDE by clicking in the gutter and setting where you want the code to pause. And then the next thing you'll need to do is to configure a launch profile. Okay. So this is my launch profile for this application. I want to run Uvicorn and uh, in, in the same way that I run fast API by running on the command line. You just have to specify what's the command you want to run. Uh, what arguments do you want? I probably want the uh, dash dash reload in there as well. So it's going to reload the application automatically when I make changes. Um, so I've got that set up now. And then in my application code, I can jump to, let's say main.py and drop a breakpoint in my code. So when I launch this, it's going to run the code from VS Code. Uh, it's going to run the command that I've specified and it's going to let me jump into the code and put breakpoints in and explore exactly what's happening in my application. So you can configure the launch profile either here in the launch.json file by typing it in manually. Um, it does give you prompts for what the fields are required. Easiest way probably is to just click add configuration and then follow the prompts under Python. So if you've got a file or a module you want to debug, or specifically it's Django Fast API, Flask or Pyramid, um, then that will actually give you all the prompts needed to just create that configuration for you. That's probably the easiest way of getting started with these launch profiles. Once you've done that, go to the run and debug icon on the left hand side, uh, pick your profile. I've got a lot in this project. Um, so then once you're ready, you can click play and it will start your application. And then if it hits a breakpoint, um, which it will in this case, because I've got it in the startup, and uh, then in the breakpoint, you can see exactly what's going on in your application. So you can see any locals, any globals. So here I've got my fast API application and I can explore, you know, all the 
variables inside there, lists and strings like that. This is an uh, this is a dictionary. I can have a look at that, see what's going on here. A couple of things you can do as well is see um, you can set a watch. So for example, um, in Fast API, I want to see um, whether um, app.debug is enabled. Uh, so that's an expression basically to see um, what's happening at any time. You, these expressions don't have to be the names of variables. They can actually, um, they can be full expression. So you can say app.debug, I don't know, is true. Um, and that will tell you false. <laughs> That's an elaborate way of doing exactly the same thing. Um, but yeah, you can write full Python expressions in the watch panel. And then inside here, you then got the ability to step forward uh, for commands, either by continuing execution or doing step over to step into the next uh, the next line. Uh, and then you can step through the code directly from the debugger. And then when you're ready, you can just press play and it will continue execution of the code. Once it's running in the background, uh, you can still go ahead and just drop any breakpoints you want into the code. So let's say I want to put a breakpoint on the locations route. Um, and then I end up hitting that route locally, then one, then it would pause execution automatically in VS Code and I can see uh, what's happening and explore all the variables just as I showed you before. So one more thing I want to show you before we wrap up is the remote development uh, extensions. There's remote development for Windows subsystem for Linux. So if you're working on Windows and you want to run the code in Linux in WSL, uh, there's this feature. There's also remote SSH. So if you want to connect to a remote machine over SSH and you know do breakpoint and debugging and testing and stuff like that on a remote machine, um, there's also remote development for containers. So the container one is the one I'll show you. Uh, it's the one I use probably the most. Uh, remote development for containers will install uh, this remote explorer panel on the left hand side. Up the top, you can switch between containers, SSH and WSL, depending on which ones you've configured. And you need to make sure that Docker is installed uh, and running. Um, and then it's going to show you a list of what dev containers you have uh, running. Uh, for example, I've got a fast API container, um, which I've already configured. Um, and you can click on that and open it up um, and launch code inside there. So if I click on that icon, it's actually going to jump into that container. If you've already got a container up and running, you can open it um, by clicking on this open icon next to the dev container. Uh, if you don't and you want to convert your running project into a dev container, you click on this icon here and then you do open current folder in container and it will reopen that folder in a Docker container and create the template for you. Uh, it'll prompt you and ask you what runtime environment you want uh, and yeah, pick Python obviously and which version of Python. It'll create the sample Docker file, spin up the Docker image and then drop you into that environment. I've actually got one up and running uh, which I can show you already that I pre-configured. This is a fast API application uh, that I'd set up and then reopened it in a dev container. With dev container is basically a spec that includes both a Docker file and just some settings that explain you know, how to run it in VS Code. Um, so there's nothing really much in here. The template does that for you. Um, you can go and override specific settings and stuff. The most important thing you probably need is the Docker file to go and customize any additional commands and stuff. Maybe you need to run for your application to run uh, properly within Docker. So once you've done that, basically you're inside the dev container um, and you just edit the code normally. That's, you know, you've got, if you've got Git installed, you can just uh, synchronize your changes with source control. Um, you can just go and work on the file directly. And then if you set up the launch profiles, like I showed you earlier, uh, to run fast API, for example, um, run and debug and then launch. And that command is running inside the Docker container. So if you set breakpoints or anything, or there's a crash as there is in this lovely demo, um, you've got the breakpoint so you can see exactly what's happening. Um, and I'm running debugging inside the Docker container. So that's um, a really cool feature and something that's super useful. If you are planning on deploying in Docker containers, then I recommend developing in Docker containers and leveraging this feature to do that. So just to leave you with a couple of fun things, um, there's loads of extensions you can install in VS Code. 
There's a couple I really recommend. Um, one of those is Thunder Client. It's if you use Postman um, before, if you develop REST APIs, and you just want a way to create uh, REST uh, HTTP requests uh, and execute them inside VS Code. Thunder Client is a brilliant way of doing that. And if you're developing, especially on Django REST framework or Fast API or something, um, just basically a way, a simple way of writing requests uh, and sending them locally and just testing out all the functionality and stuff. And then obviously I have to mention my own extension, which is VS Code Pets, uh, which adds yeah any pets you like in your coding window and you can add them and remove them and they play with each other and yeah, just generally a nice distraction on the left-hand side of the screen. All right, thanks everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, if you do have any questions about stuff that you've seen here or need any code snippets or anything to try in your own projects, yeah, please let me know and hopefully I'll see everyone uh, next year. Thanks. So welcome, Anthony. We're happy to have you here and we have some, some audience members. I hope they've already enjoyed your talk on getting started with VS Code and Python. Let's see, I had I had one question to start off with. Um, when you described the the key maps, I saw that you were probably using either IntelliJ or PyCharm before moving to VS Code. So yeah. I'm curious, kind of what um, what amazed you about VS Code that you you had to get to it, or or what did you find easier in kind of moving your workflow from one editor to another? Um, hmm. Yeah, probably it's taken me a while to set it up exactly as I'm happy with it. And that's why I wanted to do this, um, this video to show like my setup and how I've configured it and things and how I'm happy with it. Um, I think the speed of just the tool itself, um, has been a, a bit drastic change. So, you know, when I'm working in the console and I'm working on a project and I've just cloned it and then I can just type code. Uh, dot which is like on the shell you just type code and then the name of the directory and it pops up the vs code and that's you know within half a second or something on my machine so um that's probably been a fairly drastic change is that i can just hop in and out of different projects and stuff a lot quicker um whereas on the intellij and the pycharm you know it takes takes a while to load up a project and if PyCharm's already running, opening up another project is relatively quick, but VS Code's a lot faster. So that's um, something I really appreciate. Okay, so the the fast startup time and that it kind of supports maybe a, a terminal-based workflow where you can pop into and out of projects very quickly as needed. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and I've kind of added a ton of extensions. I think the extensions that are available for VS Code now uh, it's just massive and there's pretty much one for everything um so yeah i think that's that's been really beneficial is that there's a ton of really good extensions for python development in particular and just generally for integrating into different services and stuff so i can do a whole bunch of things now from vs code um, without really leaving it so nice were there any extensions that maybe you didn't mention in the talk that you find kind of invaluable yeah there's lots <laughs> i'm sure um, yeah it's an enormous library yeah i can i don't know if i can share my screen maybe i'm allowed to do that i, I think you that. should be allowed to my browser's not supported uh, maybe i'll read them out then instead I, I have almost a hundred extensions installed in my VS Code, so I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, sure, sure. But yeah, some of the important ones. Um, well, I use Azure, obviously, so um, all of the Azure integration, so you can kind of manage your web apps or your databases and stuff like that, all from VS Code. That's really helpful. Uh, the C++ integrations uh, I use quite a lot and all the CMake integrations because I work with both C and C++ uh, quite a lot. There's this uh, code spell checker, it's called, um, which works with the C, uh, like C spell. So it kind of code check, uh, spell checks your variable names, uh, your comments, oh, nice. your doc strings, um, 
uh, everything and you can add uh, if you're working in markdown as well it, it kind of works with with that um, and you can have like a, a dictionary of your like words that you use all the time um, so if there's like a special word that it thinks is a spelling mistake you can add it to your either your local user dictionary or one that's project mm. specific um, I'm a big fan of github copilot if you haven't tried that I really recommend giving it a go it's currently on technical preview I believe it's you have to join a wait list still I'm not sure uh, how long you have to wait on the wait list uh, to until you get accepted it's copilot.github.com let me put a link in the uh, no not that copilot.github.com um, copilot will actually like guess what code you want to write and suggest it for you it's a phenomenal tool it's um really good for testing actually so when you're writing unit tests um in python i'm finding that it actually i if i write a comment say check that the shopping cart is not empty or something I like that's my comment then it will actually like the next line it will guess what the test is that i'm going to write <laughs> Um, oh, nice. Like, based on the rest of the tests in the file. So if I've been using a, a mock client or something to, to call the API or I'm testing with fast API and I'm using one of the test clients, it would, like, guess that and it would guess the URLs and stuff as well. It's, it's amazing. Um, so, yeah, the GitHub Copilot I definitely, uh, definitely recommend. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned the talk, but I use a HTTP client called Thunder Client, which is integrated into VS Code. Um, that's really helpful. The Jupyter Notebooks extension um, is great as well. And then I've got a whole bunch of code formatters for different languages. If you work with JavaScript and HTML and stuff, that are um, really helpful. And yeah, that's probably it. Nice, quite quite a wide variety there. Yeah, I've got a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot in there. A, yeah, and, and it, an I think if you platform. install too many, it can it potentially can slow VS Code down um, if you have too many extensions installed. Um, so yeah, you might want to keep an eye on that. But if you go to the extensions panel, it does tell you what the startup time is for the extension in. Uh, it tells you in milliseconds how long it takes for that extension to run. Um, also, there is a uh, special um, like performance metric tool that's built into Visual Studio, which um, is if you go to help in VS Code and then go down to open process explorer, it will tell you all the running processes that VS Code is using and what CPU and memory each of them are, are for. So often if you find that VS Code is running slowly, it's normally because of an extension. So you can see mm. it in there. Francois is asking how much RAM you are using when, when you have all these extensions loaded. <laughs> uh, I, not that much. I think I've got 32 gig of RAM, which is probably quite a bit for a um, development machine. Um, not the VS Code we use anywhere near that much. Um, and processor. Uh, he wants the whole the whole notebook setup. Yeah, I'm running an iMac. Um, so this is an Intel three three point four gigahertz quad core i five. Um, twenty four gig of RAM. That's how much I've got. Um, yeah, it's more than enough uh, for VS Code. Uh, yeah, nice. I use VS Code on a machine with like 8 gig of RAM, and it runs pretty happily. Um, once you get down to 4 gig, you kind of need to be a bit more selective because you're battling with the operating system over what memory is available. And John asks now, have you been using gitpod.io with your, your local VS Code? I guess that helps you set up some virtual environments or something in the cloud? No, I haven't. Um, it looks interesting. I've been using GitHub code spaces more recently, um, uh -huh. 
which I th is still in preview, I think. Uh, so in GitHub, you can... Okay, it's similar, is it? Yeah. Um, so GitHub Code Spaces is a... You write a specification in the project, which says typically the Docker file, um, like if you wanted to install all the dependencies and run this project, here's a Docker file with the Linux distribution and all the steps to do the installation. And then like, what else would you need to do? So for example, I've got some projects where they've got a dev container set up in GitHub code spaces. So if you go to the project on GitHub, uh, I've got an example, I'll paste in the paste in there, but um, on the code button, the green button, the normally the one you get the clone but, uh, link for, there's a thing called code spaces and you can basically click on it and it will open up VS Code in the browser with all the prerequisites installed and running in a virtual machine. Um, so you can basically run, um, it's what the GitHub team actually use for github.com as well. So if they want to edit github.com uh, they've got a code space. Um, so this project has it. Uh, this is a C++ project, but it's got a lot of Python in it. Um, that's got a co uh, code space as well. And it works in VS Code using an extension called dev containers. So it will detect that that specification is in there in VS Code, and it will pop up and say, oh, this project has a dev container. Do you want to open this in a dev container? And then if you press yes, so for example, if you're on Windows, that project has got a whole bunch of uh, requirements for like a C++ compiler, CMake, Python 3.10. Um, it's got quite complicated requirements. And if you open that in VS Code, um, it will say, oh, this has got a dev container. Do you want to do that? And just click yes, and it will download the Docker file, run the build, and just do everything for you. And it will drop you into a virtual coding environment in VS Code with everything running in Docker. Um, oh, nice. So yeah, that's a really nice feature. Are there any limitations then in terms of like uh, what language extensions can be installed in that environment or does it pretty much support everything? I'm not aware of any limitations on the language extensions. Um, you do have to configure it. So in that repository, you'll see a folder called .dev container and inside there is the JSON file that specifies um, which extensions the VS Code will need. Uh, and you have to basically list them in there and then what Docker file is needed as well. There's another good example of this is if you go to, if you clone Python itself, so github.com forward slash Python forward slash C Python, if you clone that repository and then open it in VS Code, it will say, um, it will pop up and say that there is a dev container template for C Python, uh, which is actually some, something that I put together and work with a VS Code team on. Um, so if you say, okay, yes, open this in a dev container, it will actually um, run a Docker file locally that sets up all the requirements to build C Python from source uh, and run all the tests and everything you need. So it kind of skips a whole bunch of steps to um, build from build, build C Python from source, which is quite an involved process. Um, so it kind of drops you into that Docker environment uh, out of the box. Cool. So it makes it a lot easier for uh, every open source project there on GitHub to accept new contributors because they have to worry much less about how the tooling is going to be set up and, and spend a bunch of time on that instead of actually making contributions. Yeah, 100%. Um, and in future, what will happen is the, de the code spaces will be integrated into the GitHub website, uh, which is starting now. They're starting to, to roll that out um, so that when you open it, you can basically like open VS Code in the browser and make changes to the project, compile and test all in the browser. Uh, so you don't even need to download anything. So if you wanted to contribute to C Python, for example, um, you could do that entirely in the browser and test it, compile it, like a custom version of C Python, um, and run the tests <laughs> in the browser, which is just amazing. Um, so obviously, cool. it runs like a lot of that in a VM, but um, the, the interface is all in the browser. Awesome. 
Was there anything else that you want to shout out? For instance, your your books or or where to find you and and some more tips from your end. Uh, yeah, sure. If you are interested in in C Python, um, I've written a book on the Python compiler and how it works, uh, which is probably stacked up behind me. Um, that's C Python internals is the is the book, uh, and I published that about six months ago. So if you're interested in, oh, it's it's even just curious about how, or you want to learn more about languages, or programming languages, or you want to learn more about how it does memory management or multiprocessing or the how the garbage collector works or how the grammar works, like it covers basically all aspects of the internals of Python, like how does Python actually work. Um, so that's uh, you know. A, Good read, obviously. I think I uh, recommend that for <laughs> anybody. <laughs> uh, it took me a while to put it together. It's a pretty involved book. Um, and in the book as well, I go through some examples. So actually, like as a code exercise, you add a new feature to the Python programming language and compile it yourself and, uh, and test it and stuff like that. So yeah, it shows you how to do all sorts of fun things to tinker, tinker with the language. Um, yeah, if you do want to follow me, um, probably Twitter's the best option. So I'm on Twitter as Anthony PJ Shaw. I'll drop that in the uh, chat in a second. Oops, that's wrong. Uh, yeah, the book's on Amazon, and there's, I think there's a Kindle version as well, if I remember right. Um, it's definitely on Amazon at least. Um, and there will be a version in um, Korean being published um, fairly soon. Oh, nice. And in Japanese. And also, uh, I think that's it for, for the time being. But uh, well, not French? Uh, no, not French. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it might, yeah, it might be considered in the future. Um, yeah, I know that the Korean translation is being done at the moment, um, so that should be published hopefully in the next few months. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time today, Anthony. For those of you audience who haven't checked out his talk, please go do that. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.